Oh, with the edited version, because this is a family show. <laughs> says dick, because he really says dick in the real version. This really reminds me of about 99, 2000. I'm glad that there's not a lot of photos of me from that time in my life. <laughs> <laughs> they would be... Well, if yeah, one I, word described you then, what would that word be? Oh, um... Confused, probably. <laughs> and your sexuality? Not, That's not, not nearly as confused as, like, the guys working at the store where I would go to buy clothes from, as, like, a 14-year-old white kid from Irvine. <laughs> or, like, I had my mom take me there. Oh, my and... God. <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah, it is why I'm such a good dancer, though. I'm Chad Wesley Smith. This is the Jug Life Podcast. Joined, as always... By, oh, damn it! What should I say? What should I say? I can't. Oh, by, by Max. Oh, there it is. It's just joined by Max. I, I, I folded under the pressure of trying to come <laughs> up. The notorious M A M A X was such a fantastic. It, I don't know if we can top that. Yeah. It's gonna take a lot to top that one. It, I'll, I'll be working on it. <laughs> Give me another four months, and I'll come up with another nickname for you. That's another sixteen podcasts. Yeah, because we're on a every killing it with the podcast every, every week, week every roll. Week. And today we are joined by a very special guest, this big, big lug over here, IPF world champion, world record holder, the Vanilla Gorilla, the real Vanilla Gorilla. There's a lot of con- uh, we'll talk about that a bit. But a lot of contenders to your Vanilla Gorilla. That's true. Yeah. Title. I mean, I don't know about a lot. Two, two notable ones come to mind. Uh, Blaine Sumner, that was his name. I don't think I ever got to that part. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> we had Spoto challenging, yeah. calling himself the Vanilla Gorilla. Yeah. Scott Weech, that guy was, what, what happened to him? I don't know, but he was a monster. He was. He was very strong. And also a Vanilla Gorilla. Did he refer to himself as that? I definitely saw that. I mean, I, the, he's probably the earliest of the three, though, saying that, I'm guessing. Mm, in the maybe lifting Spoto. world, maybe. I mean, I think the only way is Instagram... Hashtag search Vanilla Gorilla and see what comes up the most. It's probably the only legit way. Yeah. So did you just, like, Harambe Scott Weech, or what was the situation there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I haven't heard anything from him in, in <laughs> several years. <laughs> uh, that's, that's intense. Can you imagine if you look it up and that actually what happened? Uh, that he would was, be unfortunate. He was in a zoo or something, and the, the zookeeper, you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> he was just, like, walking along with his with his kid, like, holding his kid's hand, walking through the zoo. And like, oh, shit! <laughs> this podcast sponsored by the Cincinnati Zoo. <laughs> oh, yeah, sponsors. Blaine's on top of things here. Um, this podcast is brought to you by Virus International... Grind Sports Nutrition, Trifecta Nutrition, the official meal prep company of Team Juggernaut, and a lot of other things. Now, apparently, <laughs> they're going to be way too cool for us soon. Yeah. We're providing food for everybody. For real. Like, they're killing it, so congrats to them. And mustaches and muscle-ups. It's a lifestyle. Uh, so, Blaine, as an avid listener of the Jug Life Podcast, I'm sure that you are familiar with our top ten strength feats of all time. I have become aware. It's been causing causing quite the stir, and now the subsequent lists are also getting... People love arguing. They love arguing about... They love sharing their <laughs> opinion. Me. <laughs> um, well, yeah, so Max, more so than me, was like, no, we're definitely not putting Blaine on there. Yeah, well... Um, you really got a... Ooh. It's very you got a very strong grip there, young man. <laughs> uh, and we did you did get a mention on our top five squats of all time with your five hundred kilos. You were number five. Not good enough. False. So let's make make your case. Last year at the Arnold, five hundred kilo squat, twelve hundred kilo total. Uh, twelve. I don't work in kilos. Twenty eight hundred and three pounds. Twenty eight hundred and three pounds. Okay. Well. If you take the squat suit out of there, you're down to 2,000. So it's helping you buy 800 pounds at least, right? Yeah. Bench shirt, another 800. Would you bench? Would you bench there? 881. So you really probably more like 
How much, how much work did you actually do on those two lists? Like 50 pounds of work. So we're, yeah, so now we're down to like a sub thousand pound total. And the deadlift, did you, did you pull the suit? I did, but it doesn't really count. <sighs> like another crutch. So you're, I mean, did you even lift? We're in negative pounds at this point. Yeah. At that point, you owe the crowd <laughs> a total. <laughs> you, you've taken something from people by wearing the equipment. Are, are we talking about the, the top five squat list or the top 10 feats of strength list, either, though? Either one. I mean, because they're both wrong. That's... They would both be wrong. <laughs> well, explain to me why. why. Why does Blaine Sumner deserve the acclaim of a top 10 Jug Life podcast strength feats top five squat? Biggest squat in IPF history. Biggest bench in IPF history. Biggest total IPF history. Biggest Wilkes. And I'll go ahead and say, because uh, the records that I broke, Carl Ingvar's, right? Carl Ingvar's squat. Yeah. He, was, he was the god of the IPF, mm -hmm. right? And so broke his squat world record by 20 or so pounds. Um, the bench world record I broke by, the old record was 815 for the three lift bench. So I broke that by... Did you that your opener or second? I, I broke it on my second with 827 and broke it on my third with 885. So 885 to 815, breaking the old world record. And then the total was uh, 2803. Carl Ingvar's old world record total was like 90 pounds less than that. It was like 2710 or something. So you and crushed that. I crushed it. But not only did I crush it, the 2710 was also what people were thinking was the untouchable Unbelievable number, right? Because right. Siders, yeah. when Siders broke that 2,600 barrier, nobody was even close to totaling 2,600 pounds. Um, and then Carl Ingbar comes along and hits that 2,700 pound total, and people say people said that was like the greatest powerlifting accomplishment ever at the time. And so I think by breaking I don't that know by who these people he's referring to are yeah, but the IPF people, oh, the, the real IPF. the real powerlifting. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Uh, so well, to, to break that, case for himself it there. is actually yeah. a very strong case. Now that you put it that way, that that squat was giant. That 500 squat was gigantic. Yeah, I mean that was. Jo all joking aside, yeah. it was awesome. I probably didn't include you on there one because of the the gear, but two, <laughs> and we'll talk more about that. Two, what what's that thing called a proximity bias? When you're uh, yeah. like when you know someone well, that you kind of diminish their accomplishment or expertise yeah I, I i think i might take you for granted blaine yeah that's rude chad i'm sorry that's i'm, very I'm rude. apologizing that's on the air true. right yeah. now thank you because thank I, was, you. I was i was there in person watching it and it's like i know you and i knew for and we knew for a year over a year like that you could do it so it wasn't like a surprise to me when you did it where the other people i don't know them so when i see the number i'm like oh Shit, yeah, it kind of comes out of nowhere when you don't see him. Yeah. But when you're like mustache to mustache with like <laughs> on a regular basis, you don't think about you don't think about that as often, right? And then holy shit, this guy squats 500, 2800 total. Cuz I mean, yeah, most know. of the time before it was like, well, why haven't you done this yet, Blaine? Yeah. We you're, were you're squatting a thousand happen, I think. 1025 what, 8 weeks in a row or something. Yeah. I was, I mean, I've been ready, for, I was ready for that 500 kilo squat for a few years, but I knew I had to, knew I had to go three for three in a meet at some point to be able to load it for the third attempt. And it was, it was the first time I'd gone three for three in the squat. Because you squat high. Because I squat high. Okay. You usually miss them on depth? Always. You said, you told me right, you had not missed a squat, like failed to stand up with a squat for years. Yeah, I, I don't. I can't even remember the last time in a meet that I failed to come up with a squat. Um, yeah. Training? You ever put those blocks to work? Or are they just all for show? Um, they're all for show. I mean, they've saved my life on some bench presses, but <laughs> I've never really failed to come up with a squat that I can think of. Yeah, so for, for people, if they do not follow Blaine on Instagram and stuff, the Vanilla Gorilla 92, at the Vanilla Gorilla 92. Um, he's in there training by himself, squatting a thousand pounds every week, every day it seemed like for a while. He's going ape shit all the time. And they get into that. But make sure you go and follow him there. But his, his training is, is really remarkable to watch. Um, you know, if you're familiar at all with equip training, to be 
on your own, putting on your own suit, wrapping your own knees, that kind of stuff. And I know you've, you've been using someone to wrap your knees a little bit now. Mm -hmm. That's a more recent right. deal. But to, to do that type of lifting by yourself, to get under 1,000, 1,050, oh, yeah. 1,100 That's... with no spotters, just some, some blocks next to you, is a really remarkable feat of mental fortitude. Rivaled only by a chicken shake drinking, and we'll get into that more. There's a lot of things Which we're going to get into. Which one comes first? Which one builds the other psychological advantage? <laughs> I don't know, but chicken shakes get a lot more views on Instagram than 1,080-pound squats, which yeah. is depressing and well, surprising. Once it, exceeds, once it exceeds 500 pounds, it becomes irrelevant. It becomes <laughs> less impressive than anything else. It's true. The proximity to 500 pounds is what matters slightly above it and slightly below 500 and it's amazing six seven hundred eight nine thousand it's like oh whatever <laughs> that guy's really strong it's, it's too con it's too yeah. confusing yeah but in regards to you getting just hype as shit all the time I mean, you've always been like that and what was amazing to me watching you at the arnold last year is it's not just it's time to do the big squat blaine gets fired up it's it's not a zero to 60 kind of thing He's going from like eighty to one twenty. <laughs> you know, seventy kilos, seventy kilos on the bar in the back room. He's fucking pacing back and forth like oh, it was nice. nonstop. It was four or five hours straight, where I'd I'd be back there and I'd I'd kind of look over to see what what you were doing, and I'd start to walk over to film something because I thought he was gonna take, you know, his next warm up. Nope, he's just he's just pacing around or sitting with his headphones on, you know, listening to whatever terrible music you're listening to, and they're just just head just going. I would be exhausted by way before I even get to the get to the lift. I mean, were, were you like that when you were playing football and stuff too? Just fired up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, powerlifting is a lot less tiring to go do some singles than it is to play football game, but. I'd be, I mean, emotionally exhausted. Oh, yeah. yeah. I have a lot of emotion to give out. You My do. heart's very big. Lots have of... you ever gotten caught in a glass case of emotion? A few times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what, what's what's going through your mind when you, you know, you're walking up to 500 kilos? Uh, it's, it's the only thing that matters to me at the moment. It's, it feels like life or death. I mean, it might be. I, I, I really... If How do you think you, that your lifting rates on the very important strength feat uh, caveat of chance of fatality? Oh. Because that was suggested by one of the readers. Uh, there's a 0% chance that it would not be number one. Like, you can't really die by barbell on a deadlift. Um, you have, in an equipped squat, there's a much higher chance of bar going up than a raw lift where you're, like, stalling out, right? Lots of, lots more things can go terribly wrong. So high chance of fatality. Hmm. We give them a nine in that case. I mean, right? I don't see how it's not a ten. Well, it's not like you're squatting with it on your head. That's true. <laughs> or holding it above your head. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so what? What? What's your what's your go-to pump-up song? Um, anything by Five Finger Death Punch, really. Well, five finger and yeah, punch. I'm mainstream and I'm all right with that. What's up with the chalk on your face? Um, because people don't like it, that's and so I do it. Is that why you squat raw with suit? Yes, that's why I squat raw with suit. People do. People get very frustrated <laughs> and confused by by your categorizing this raw with shirt, raw with suit. They get very confused. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, I, I took me a second when I read it the first time. Raw with suit. Oh, oh, I get it. That's funny. <laughs> but I can see where that would really piss people off. It does. Bother them. Do you get a lot of questions about it? Yeah. What suit? What raw suit? Yeah. I thought raw was with no suit. Yeah, but this is raw with suit. Yeah. Okay. Same thing. <laughs> what kind of suit do you use? I use a Titan Super Centurion. Are you sponsored by Titan at all? I am sponsored yeah. by Titan. Long time. Long really? time. Is Titan, are there other companies even making them? Inzer, I guess, probably makes single ply. Inzer makes single ply. Metal did. I don't think they're, or they are not IPF approved anymore. Do you feel like you get more out of the suit or more out of the wraps? Suit, for sure. Because yeah. you squat all of your hips, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And I, for the longest time, I wrapped myself. Oh, really? And it was more of like a, I guess I'm supposed to wear so knee wraps when I wear a squat just, suit. Yeah, so, just yeah, just, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, as a, as a big man in, Without a squat suit, uh, yeah. it's hard enough to wrap, to bend 
over and wrap your own knees. And the suit's got to really be hindering your ability to get down there. You're just kind of like... And I'm very unflexible. You're supposed to wrap your knee with your legs straight. Yeah. And so my um, knees are like 45 degrees. Yeah. Just <laughs> There's a little space right in Britella, as you can see the skin. <laughs> but it's kind of like dangling behind you. There's another like meter left of wrap that could still be there. Yeah. Did you start in powerlifting like right off the bat? You were doing equipment, or did you did someone like, hey, come in here, try this, put this on, or did you start like you know a lot of people do where they start maybe raw or start you know kind of yeah. slowly getting into it? I uh, I was squatted and bench for football. That's right. Um, and when I was playing college football, I would do like one meet a year. And oh, okay, so you were doing it pretty early. Yeah, I mean obviously football was the focus, but. Uh, at that time, like 2010-ish and before, raw wasn't even a, a thing in the IPF. You know, yeah, there weren't, right. there wasn't even really a raw category. So, um, I would, I would use a squat suit or bench shirt sometimes. Um, I got into it from Dan and Jen Gaudreau in Colorado. Okay. Um, Did you? I remember saying that the first time seeing your squats would have been very early in my powerlifting as well. So like 2010. And I was not, you know, there wasn't nearly the prevalence of information and stuff. And this, so you're squatting, I think it was a video, you squatting 905. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, wasn't quite sure, like, what I was looking at because you see a multiply squat, you know, sumo stance kind of squat, you know what's going on there. But your squat looks like a squat, actually. So I, I, can, I was like, wow, this guy squat 905, like, holy shit. And then I started hearing, oh, is this in a suit? Like, what does that mean? But I was very <laughs> yeah. confused. I was very confused by your raw with suit lifting at that time. I remember talk, talking to you on Facebook or something way back. Like, it had to be 2010 or 2011, even before Juggernaut stuff was involved. Yeah. We go back a long ways, buddy. I do. So you just, right off the bat, that you were doing... You had suit. Did you ever have a period of time where you like were out of the suit and wraps for you know a couple of years, or did you just did you just rotate that in your training? Um, not for a period of years. Obviously, <clears throat> I would probably use a squat suit, bench shirt, maybe like five times or something before meet. Right. Um, but there wasn't like raw competition. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that started in 2011 in IPF. Maybe 2012. 2012 in the IPF. I think USAPL had I mean, 2009 or 10 was maybe the first Raw Nationals, and there was like nobody there. And you were the first ever IPF Raw World Champion? Yeah, 2012. Puerto Rico? That was uh, Sweden. Okay. That's, Puerto Rico is where you had the hip labrum? No, I tore my hip labrum on my second attempt in uh, Sweden at the Raw Worlds. Well, let's then, talk about that a little bit more. Let's talk about it. So, I have a torn hip labrum. I have <laughs> two one, torn. two, yeah. One bad one and one not as bad one. And it happened in an attempt in a meet that you went on to still win the world championship. Yep. So, I mean, how did it happen? So I took my, op this was 2012, I took my opening squat of 375 kilos, 827, and I'd never gotten called for depth in my life. And so keep in mind, this was the first raw world championships. It was in Europe. Um, all three judges were sitting in front of the lifter. Mm. and. We kind of had the assumption they were looking for an Olympic squat, honestly. Um, I thought I absolutely buried my first one well below parallel. I got turned down on depth. Um, I knew the people I was competing against, and I knew as long as I get a lift in, I'm going to win the win world. So that second squat, I go down to the hole, even let a little air out just to like oh, let myself be mouth or your butt? both. Okay. <laughs> Not too much out of the butt, so it didn't push me up. Yeah, you don't want to go right yeah, back to the top. Like propulsion. Yeah. yeah. So, like, let That's myself get buried. Yeah. Let myself get buried by it. So, like, I cannot, like, this is deep, right? And so I come up, and as soon as I'm coming out of the hole, my hip, my left hip, like, felt something, finished it. I was like, it hurt really, really bad. How heavy was the squat was this? It was 827. So I re-had, retake my opener on my second. Um, got it. I think I went to like 865 or something, and just there was that hip was done. Um, 
I didn't know what I had done at the time. Um, and actually, a week after winning the Raw Worlds, I had to go to the USAPL Men's Nationals a, a week after, um, which was... Open, uh, single ply. Nationals. Single ply, right. And that was the... Just for the listener, too, there'll be times when we say open. We're not referring to the age division. In, in the IPF, the classic worlds, right? Classic. Mm -hmm. Classic worlds are raw. Open is single ply. Yep. So a week after that, I didn't know what I did to my hip. I was hoping it wasn't bad. I mean, I couldn't even like sit in a chair and put force through my foot without just searing, searing pain in my hip. Um, but I went to Open Nationals the following weekend in Orlando, and that's where I did my first thousand three pound squat. Um, so won that meet to qualify myself for the Worlds, Open Worlds, 2012 in Puerto Rico. Um, I knew my hip was super messed up. I couldn't raw squat at all. Um, felt okay in the suit. Um, so struggled through that year. It got to 2013. Um, I moved from Wyoming to Oklahoma and I was like, I have to get this thing checked out. I had zero, zero squat mojo. I mean, up until I tore it, I was putting like 50 pounds on my raw squat every year, just religiously. Every, you know, every month I was handling more weight and training. Um, just completely lost my mojo. It was so painful. Got an MRI done and had a um, pretty bad torn hip labrum. Decided against the surgery. They said because of my size, they had to cut through my glute to get to it. That's and a it, lot of that's a lot of meat. It's a lot of booty. Through. A lot of booty. Um, and then just the recovery period from a hip labrum is very very long. And going through the glute, you know, I got the whole spiel about hey, you'll never be able to squat again if you cut through your glute muscle. Right. So decided to go not do that. Um, it's kind of at that point where I started transitioning to more equipped lifting because I put the suit on, even straps down, and having that support and compression around the hips mm -hmm. made it feel a lot better. But at the time, my heart was still into raw lifting. I struggled through 2013, 2014, not really making any progress on my raw squat. Um, 2015 started to come around, but I went through about three or, three or so years there with just pain all the time in the hips, very, very little progress. Well, you're saying, I mean, you did an 827 in 2011, or 2012, Worlds? Uh, I did 881 in 2012 before that Worlds okay. in Australia. All right, yeah, because I remember, I remember seeing that. So yeah, I guess 881 to 915 is slower. I was thinking 827 was your best squat, so continue. Yeah, yeah well, just struggle through uh, with that hip injury and still still bothers me. I mean, I'll have periods where I can train a raw squats for a few weeks and start. When, and when did the second one happen? Uh, raw nationals in 2013. Hey, so. I think that was just like an overcompensation. Yeah, exactly. Deal. And it, it wasn't as bad. Like, I mean, I, I knew I'd done something to it and f felt the same pain, same mechanism, same things bothered it. Just instead of a nine out of 10, it was a maybe five out of 10. So what did you do to, to, I guess you didn't heal it, but what did you do to get away from the pain? Just the suit makes a big enough difference that you can kind of deal with it? Yeah, it was, it was kind of wild. I mean, I could try and do a raw squat with three, 400 pounds and be absolutely miserable. Like wow. any force through my foot just killed my hip. And I could throw that suit on and there's almost no pain. Wow. What about the, what do you call them, a good, good week? The good weeks, yeah. yes. Uh, just some exercise that I tried to, I tried to squat as similarly as I could to my raw squat to keep my strength up without hurting it. Because it was very specific what hurt it. Right. Like uh, a very a certain part of that range of motion. So if I did like a narrow stance, high bar, trying to stay more upright squat, it hurt a lot less. Right. Leg presses didn't hurt it. It was, it was all in the hip, right? Yep. Yeah. And you are definitely a very hip dominant squatter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's talk more about, you know, the... The transition from, from gear to raw, both for yourself and maybe for people who maybe are interested in making the transition, how, how they would go about doing that. <laughs> the transition from raw to gear. So, yeah. Uh, as I was kind of saying earlier, t my heart was still in raw. Um, you know, I'd obviously been in a squat suit, bench shirt even 2000, I don't know, eight, nine, as early as that. And it always frustrated me because. The competitions were always equipped. I I would see these guys' raw training numbers and see what they do in equipment. I'd say, oh, this is bull crap. Why can they do so much more? Like, this guy did 
200 pounds more in a squat suit. I only do 25 pounds more. Yeah. Um, classic hater. Classic hater, hater. right? I hated them because I you ate them. Ate in them. <laughs> you hate them because he ate them. Exactly. Um, he hate them and then he ate them. Oh th shit. That's true. And then I absorb their, <laughs> their cheating powers. powers. Yeah. Um, so my heart was still in Raw. Uh, 2012, I won Raw Worlds. No one was even close to me. Raw was still very new. Um, I went to Equip Worlds the same year, 2012, and got my butt handed to me. I got sixth place. And I had that same frustration with the gear. Like, I knew I would wreck all these dudes in the Raw squat. Like, no one, none of those guys who beat me could even come close to me in the Raw squat, but they smashed me um, at Open Worlds. Mm. Yeah. This is exactly what some of the most famous strength coaches coach in the country talks about people that are raw they might be strong but then they come over and they try gear and they just can't unrack those weights they can't do it <laughs> right i think that's the case here and so i have I, so i do have an appreciation of of these raw lifters who see the gear and say oh it's stupid it's cheating mm -hmm. um like oh this guy benches 500 raw and does eight 80 in the shirt, something. So I've, I've been there, right? I've walked in those shoes, and because I, I hated that these guys just destroyed me when I knew I was stronger than them. Um, but instead of being a, a beta male, I was like, you know what? I can stay stay raw and, and keep being a big fish in a small pond and, and winning worlds. But there was these absolute monsters on the equip side. You know, I don't know how many of the juggernaut followers know them, but like Carl Ingvar Christensen, um, Viktor Testov from Ukraine, Svistanov from Ukraine, um, Andre Konovalov from Russia, like just yeah. huge, huge guys who were, um, they, they kicked my butt. Um, and so many of the top, you know, particularly Eastern European raw lifters now are former single ply IPF lifters who, you know, failed drug tests or just decided to, to stop doing that. But Milanichev, that would be his background. Yuri Belkin, that would be his background. You know, probably the two best uh, raw with wraps lifter. Yeah, Pozdi, oh, Believ, yeah. all those guys. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I want to hear you say it because I know you believe it that single ply lifting, what's, what's more competitive? What's harder? On the IPF, op or the, on the IPF world level, equipped lifting is for sure harder. It's for sure, the competition's for sure deeper. Um, we kind of live in a bubble in North America, where I mean, raw lifting outnumbers equipped lifting unbelievably. Because uh, of course, powerlifting has grown a ton, but when you did the first raw nationals, uh, what was your first raw nationals? I think it was two thousand nine. How many 10. competitors do you think there were? Uh, 30, 30, 40, 40, yeah. I don't know, And like, tiny. Gra granted, since 2009 or 10, powerlifting has probably grown tenfold. So even if the equivalent would be 300 lifters now, well, there's 1,200 lifters at Raw Nationals. Mm -hmm. How big was, so that's what, 400 times growth? Yeah. In 2009, 2010, how big were equipped nationals for you? Ah. Uh, I don't know, but I would, I would think that the equip national numbers attendance has probably gotten smaller since then. Yeah, in the I, U.S. I'd, I'd heard that this year they were having a lot of trouble getting people to register. Yeah. yeah, and they've even gone now to combining. So they used to have like men's nationals was its own thing, women's nationals was its own thing, uh -huh. and now they've combined it all. And I can't remember if they've combined masters too into uh, the equip nationals. Grind Sports Nutrition is committed to providing athletes with the highest quality supplements to fuel their training. Grind products are designed by Renaissance Periodization and contain only ingredients and dosages with substantial bodies of evidence to support their effectiveness. No fluff or fillers. Get on your grind because your success is earned, not given. So while the U.S. is surging with the raw and and falling off probably with the the single ply, other countries it's it's the reverse. So why why should American lifters start putting gear on? Why is that the way, Blaine? That's the way because that's the American way. We've got to be the best in the world. Um, it's 
being in the IPF, you get make, make a lot of friends in the you know across the globe. Some of us make friends, some of us make enemies, but you know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the the Russians, the U Ukrainians, Norwegians, they they look at raw lifting as I'm not gonna say a joke, but like raw is training and mm. equipped is competing. Um, here in the U.S., it's obviously raw is a hundred times more popular. And j just to talk in about which one's more com competitive or not, an, an easy stat to look at is if you go back for the past 10, 20 years and look at the team points at the Worlds, like, so we'll say the first Raw Worlds was 2012, but if you look at the open world results from the past, you know, 10, 20 years, the top three countries are always Russia, Poland, Ukraine, like almost always, every single year, those three. Germany's up there was up there sometimes, but Russia, Ukraine, Poland, and then you look at the this year at like Raw Worlds. I think top three countries were U.S., Canada, and Great Britain, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, never, never, ever, ever in any time recently has the U.S., Canada, or Great Britain been any good at on the open IPF world level. Yeah, you were the so, first champion, U.S. champion in quite some time, world champion, right? The first, yeah, male in eight eight years. Oh wow! You know, Russia and Ukraine don't have some experiment super heavyweight who could come and like beat Ray yeah. in Raw. Or you know, it's it's not to say that um, every great equipped lifter could come to Raw and, and beat beat the top Raw guys. Mm. But the the top Raw guys would take years and years if they ever even got to that level of being a top equipped lifter. And then the the level of competition too, the depth is. You're, is so much deeper on the equip level. You're not going to have someone who's been powerlifting for three or four years be in the top in the world. Yeah. It takes years to develop that strength and then years to develop the proficiency. So when you when you went from raw, raw squatting, competing raw, getting beat in equipment, that point where you were getting your ass kicked in equipment to feeling like you, or I guess till you started to kind of catch up to those guys, Largely, was there any kind of like big change or shift? There's got to be some kind of shift in your training because you're using gear now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and how long was that time frame to where it was, you know, like okay, I'm I'm, I'm going to change my train or I'm going to figure this out. Like how long was that? Was it years or was it a short learning curve for you? It was years, and it probably would have been shorter if I had decided earlier, like. I'm gonna care less about raw, because the whole time I've still been trying to like climb the little raw ladder. And yeah. if I had just focused more on on learning the suit, and even to this date, that 1,100 pound squat has really been my only impressive use of the squat suit. Like, I think my next biggest squat that's ever passed in in competition is like 1,047. So if, if you look at my best raw squat to that, I mean that's like maybe. I'm pr getting 100 pounds of carryover at, at 1,047 or so. Right. Yeah, that's and the suit plus the, the knee suit wraps. plus the knee wraps. Right, there's, yeah. there's guys getting that much out of just knee wraps. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, my my problem is I'm always getting called on depth. So if, right. if I could get it an inch lower all the time, I'd you know be pushing into the 1100s. But I'm I still wouldn't consider myself good with the suit. So, have you ever tried wearing like two suits? Or what we what some people refer to as multiply. Yeah, <laughs> multiple plies, multiple layers. I guess in some single ply federations, yes. they, you're allowed to wear a briefs under your. Suit. You're allowed to wear multiple layers of single, of single ply. ply. You can have four squat suits on. <laughs> if it's cold. If it's cold out, you're allowed to wear more than one squat suit. I think that's the rule. <laughs> to, to be fair, I think it is one pair of single ply briefs plus okay. one single ply suit. And then seven meter wraps. That's the limit. I don't think they really check those, but uh, yeah. So as an equipped lifter, or so much, you know, so much of the debate and and I'll take full responsibility. Responsibility has a negative connotation in that sense. Credit. I'll take full credit. Blame, responsibility, or credit, depending on how your perspective. Yeah, who you are. <laughs> yeah, uh, forcing this divide in. Uh, raw versus equipped lifting but in that my intention was never to you know no one has ever doubted i don't think that ipf single ply lifters are 
extremely strong. And ones who, who do both raw and, and single ply, raw and equipped, like yourself, make that apparent. That you take the squat suit off and you're still really strong. And even if those guys were getting more carryover from you or than, than you were, it's not... When you watch you know, Carl Christensen do a squat, it looks like a squat. So you can imagine, hey, I bet if he didn't have that suit on, he'd still be very strong. Multiply, though, eh, a bit more dubious. <laughs> a bit more dubious about what those guys can do. And and, and their claims out there, you know, Louis Simmons says that they're, they'd beat all the raw guys and stuff, but as an equipped lifter in a one section of equipped lifting, how do you view multiply powerlifting? Probably the same way you do. With your eyes closed. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, it's exactly like you said. Uh, to the untrained eye, I mean, so anyone off the street, if they see a IPF squat in suit and wraps or an IPF raw squat, they probably look the same. You know, maybe the raw squat is faster on the descent or something, mm -hmm. but it still looks the same. You show that a multiply squat, and yeah, it's you've got the stance going on. You know, the we won't even go into the depth thing here, but they're not. It's not the same depth. Does anyone squat wide, pretty wide with a single ply suit? I mean, it's probably not nearly as, you're not gonna get depth anyways, but like, are there people that squat fairly wide with a single ply suit? In the IPF? You're probably you're probably actually one of the wider ones, I'd imagine. Yeah, I am. I mean, in the IPF, you, I mean, there's no there's certainly there's some, but sure. the, the top squatters in the IPF, even in gear, no, you don't see the wide stance. Yeah, it looks, it looks like a regular squat. Do, do you think that the backlash to multiply lifting and high squats and and the judging problems and stuff in the u.s is a big part of the reason why raw has outpaced single ply so much in the usapl i have i've never really thought about that but absolutely because i see comments all the time on social media about you know equip lifting equip lifting and so putting equipped and yeah. or multi and single ply in the same bucket for sure, oh, for sure. i mean I, i've had that you know reposting your your videos that people they just think equipment, and that's, you know, well, if Blaine took the suit off, he's doing, you know, 600. <laughs> yeah. But with it on, he's doing 1,100. And that's, that's of course, not the case. That's, that's going to be frustrating to be lumped in with such a nefarious group. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what nefarious means, but it sounds negative. It is. You can Google it after. <laughs> so, let me throw this out there about the gear, too, then. Well, I'm going to get Max to convert now. He's gonna, oh, okay. he's gonna, he's gonna convert, right? Because we all, well, not we all, but so many of the, the new popularity of the raw lifting and everything talks about strength as a skill, right? And I'm sure Olympic yeah. lifting is even more so. It's, yeah, yeah. it's more skill than, than strength at some point, right? Or a, fair, a balance at least. So, in no part of equipped lifting, is, is the skill factor less than raw. So, like, to be a raw powerlifter, you can be great and not, I mean, not be super skilled at the lifts. But we all want to preach about strength as a skill. Mm. So, there's everything that it takes to be successful in the equip lifting. It takes that same amount to be good in the raw lifting plus an extra something, right? So, to do, so I've squat, 915 is my best raw squat. 1100 is my best geared squat. So to do that 1,100 pound equip squat, it, it took 915 pounds right. of strength, right? But another 100 and something pounds of, of skill, technique, proficiency. Yeah. Yeah, so it's right. the, the equip lift is just as much requirement for strength as raw lifting is, but you have this whole other gap that well, is technique, skill, proficiency. I think let's, let's take a step back there because by your own admission, 915 raw is not necessary to do that. I mean, Correct. The, the strength requirement, and this is kind of the reason that, that equip lifting of any type has never interested me, and why it's just a tough kind of thing for me to evaluate. Or, and raw, equipped, a bit, of, a bit of apples and oranges, or maybe like, what's like a, maybe like oranges and tangerines. <laughs> Because they're similar. Yeah, yeah. Same family, but, but there's something different. Oranges are bigger, though, right? Yeah. So, well, that, so that's the or, equipped. Are we talking organic? Right. You know, cuties? You guys ever have the little cuties? Those are delicious. Yeah. Anyways, They're tiny, on. but delicious. Uh, so maybe even better than regular oranges. But, 
is, is the ambiguity of, of how much is the person getting out of the suit. And so to say that 915 of raw strength was necessary to squat 1100, what, you know, you're on the low, relatively low end of carryover out of your suit, right? Mm-hmm. So someone was maybe more skilled in the suit and they brought their raw squat up from, you know, let's say they're doing 750 in sleeves and 975 or something or close to 1,000 in the suit. If they came up to 800, you know, are, are now they doing 1,050? If they do 850, are they doing 1,100 with less strength? Right. So, with especially the single ply IPF stuff, if you increase your raw strength, your equip numbers will 100% go up. Absolutely, no doubt. So there's, you still have that same desire to get stronger. Um, there's just a, this extra added element of, it takes skill and technique, practice to, to get the most out of your equipment at the same time. So if, anytime you increase your raw strength, you're gonna improve your equip lifts as well. So let's say today, I, I decide, Blaine, I want to do equip lifting. Never touched a squat suit, never touched a bench shirt before. What's the first thing you got to do? Find somebody who has used it before and knows what they're doing. Not something you can just figure out off of YouTube videos? Uh, you can get started there, mm. but I mean, it's probably, it's probably like any of this powerlifting or lifting stuff, you know, there's a lot of information out there now, but without having some one-on-one contact with people who know what they're they're doing, and, and unfortunately, it's a uh, it's a dying art. The equip stuff is for sure getting less popular because of that. There's less people out there to talk to about it, and there's there's a very very clear difference um, in the kind of the mentality of equip lifters versus raw lifters. The especially in the IPF, the, the equip guys are so hush-hush about their training, what they're doing. I'm kind of rare in the terms of I try and put a lot out there, but there's, getting good in the gear is such a, I mean, it's, it's secrets, like there's, there's tricks, there's secrets that, you know, if I figure something out in my squat suit, and like, oh, I did this and I did 20 pounds more, like I'm not gonna make a YouTube video about here's right, how you get right. 20 pounds out of your, right? Because right. the- very selfish. I'm, I'm very selfish, so. So the the content on you know equip stuff is pretty limited. So they just gotta they gotta find someone and and try it. Yeah, that's pretty pretty simple step there I guess. You just gotta find. I I can't think of. There's a couple like masters guys who yeah. live single ply uh, in Southern California that come to mind, but I can't think of anyone. I even I mean you be the only one I can think of that does. I mean Caleb Williams is the only person I know. Yeah. That also has done single ply. I guess Ed would might know, but I mean, he lifted so long ago, and yeah, even that single ply is it different? How much? How much different? So th- that's another thing that's I guess a bit always confusing to me in uh, equip lifting, and it happens in raw, particularly more raw with wraps. But when you were squatting, you know, when you're squatting and you're a super centurion versus what Brian Siders was doing, how much different do you think the suit is? How much the, more potential is there? Um. Out of yours. So Cider squatted in Inzer gear, and he used the TRX. Mm-hmm. Um, the the Super Centurion is a more advanced suit theoretically than the TRX. What makes it more advanced? There, the the seams on it, the material. I mean, it's all single ply polyester. The way the bias runs, or something. Yeah. So it. Yeah. The, uh, reinforced seams. You know, theoretically, that's what they say, but. Right. The uh, well, certainly the hype. the gear we're using now is way more advanced than than cones but in the past i don't know decade or so there hasn't been much advanced so joe joe capolino who's the number two guy in the u.s he gets like three i think he's gotten 350 pounds from suit and wraps before and he uses the same suit ciders did that trx i guess the ipf kind of tries to it's limited more so than in multiply powerlifting when there is really substantial ad- advancements in the stiffness of the equipment and, and all that kind of stuff. The IPF kind of curtails that with their rules about what they're approving. Yeah. And it's not an anything goes scenario. Yeah. And the, the 885 world record bench I did was in a stock, n- no, no custom, no alterations, uh, regular katana, which is like, I mean, I think it was available in 2006 or seven. What size was it? 
it was not, I mean, I put it, you were there, I put it on myself. I mean, like, what does the size say on it? So your singlet was, your your custom Gorilla singlet was 7XL. Yes. Well, the... 7XL? (laughs) Seven. I saw it with my own eyes. There's a lot of boy to fit in that singlet. (laughs) That's a lot. First thing I saw when I walked in here a couple days ago, or yesterday, and saw Blaine and Chad, the first thing that hit me, you're a lot bigger than Chad. (laughs) Blaine is a giant man. I mean, his Chad's body, a giant man, and his, Blaine is also a very giant man. His body but. is more voluminous, yeah. <laughs> but he only weighs a kilo and a half more. Well, what's funny is, is he, I pack the dense muscle <laughs> in, this and is, my legs are much bigger than his. I don't know if you... Yesterday, I'm in the gym, and I look over, and I see... You see Marissa? <laughs> five feet tall. Uh, Call for her height, though. Yeah. <laughs> a couple other people, you know, my regular size people, five foot seven, five foot eight. Chad, Blaine, taller than Chad, and then walking right past Blaine is Rutger, who's like 15 feet tall. Yeah. There's these, the discrepancy between Rutger and Mar- Marissa. <laughs> it's like four times taller than Marissa. Rutger is gigantic. When you think about like the, just like this bizarre discrepancy between the size of people, and then everyone today, the powerlifters, yeah, Alyssa Ritchie at like four feet tall, and then you know <laughs> Steve, who's who's also gigantic. Yeah, yeah. It was very. Rutgers tall for his height too, because he says he's only six six, right? He's a solid seven foot nine. <laughs> <laughs> he, he is a very tall six six. So he drives a Fiat. Know. A little less. Uh, we, some, he's from the Netherlands. Yeah. Anyone from so a little European country like that, no matter how yeah. tall they are. I bet he drinks like his coffee cup is like one of those tiny little ones. And, oh, I can't finish this today. You know, he eats a grape without the skin for lunch or something. <laughs> yeah. So, you've also very successfully, you know, maybe the most successfully in the IPF combined competing raw and competing uh, equipped. And I know that you had a big transition in the in the way that you organized your training, probably what four years ago now, three four years ago. Um, so just tell us tell us how you know what a typical week structure is for you. What what you were doing with your high frequency training, and I know you've changed again recently, but. Mm-hmm. So yeah, back when we first started putting content out for Juggernaut, I was doing uh, high frequency stuff. I'd worked with Mike T for about a year. Um, but previously to that, you were one time a week frequency. Yeah, I was a very squat well, once, crunch once, to the once. Yep. And then just cannonballed into <laughs> high frequency training. There's no like transition period from one time to to what you're about to say, right? Right. It was just just go for it. Yeah. So, yeah. I would. Uh, it's very simple when I break it down. But is training four times a week every single day was a squat, a bench press, and a deadlift. Right. And very very specific so like the furthest i'd get away from a bench press would maybe be like a pin press furthest on a deadlift would might be like rdls or block pulls so staying very similar and um mostly like moderate intensity so i every day like doing three lifts each day my first lift was my top priority right so i prioritize my equipped squat bench and deadlift first so in my equipment i would just do singles usually working around 90% ish for singles. Um, and then my you know raw stuff, whether it be a raw pin bench or um, raw pause squat, I would do linear periodization on that. So okay. start off at eight reps, and right, right. work my way down. And then with the singles, you just would work to a certain number of singles each week or increase that each week or increase the weight? Yeah, so with again, with the gear, I was worrying more about just getting good with the gear, and making it a skill. So I found working that 90%-ish range, you know, I wasn't worrying about hitting PRs or pushing right, my right, weight right. up. It was like, all right, I did 1,025 in the suit, and it felt not so good. This week, my depth was a little better, and, and my squat was faster. So, you know, just... So you did 1,025. How many weeks in a row was it? I for, It was, ended up being 13 or something weeks yeah. crazy. And you just work up to maybe like one or two singles with those weights mm-hmm. and, and just to dial the skill in, then you move on to the rest of the work. Yep. But to get there, that's got to be... Cause it's, volume. it's like an hour and a half to get there. Yeah, because we trained together in Texas like 2012. It would have been May 2012, I think. 
and we trained at Metroflex Arlington with Josh Bryant, which, you know, famous Ronnie Coleman, Branch Warren, Johnny Jackson, all this stuff. Total shithole. Yeah. <laughs> like, bent bars, everything. And earlier that week, you had squatted 1,025, probably, just for the sake of guessing that was that's the most likely number you've, you've done. <laughs> and... Then comes back, so to, to say that he was training low, like moderate to low intensity, he had 1,025 on a Monday or a Tuesday, and then this was Saturday or Sunday, and he was doing, oh, that, he did tripled 815 yeah. raw. Yeah. He went like 715 triple, 765 triple, 815 triple, and then benched, and then deadlifted, and had benched in the shirt bay a couple days before. Like every really single yeah. hash session yeah. is hard. Yeah, yeah. very. Okay. And, and then, uh, the, I guess, the past six, five or six months, I've gone back to squatting once a week, deadlifting once a week, benching twice a week. Interesting. Why the change? Um, a, I needed the change, and B, I've, I'd done just squat, bench, and deadlift for so long, I felt like I got to the point where I needed to build more muscle. Yeah. So... With doing the squat bench deadlift, I'm not, I wasn't doing hardly any accessories. Um, now I'm to the point, so my like my squat day, I'll do my equip squat, raw squat, hammer the heck out of some belt squats, and right. like leg extensions, leg curls. Yeah. Bench day, after benches, I'll hit some dumbbells, shoulders, triceps, so hit, get more muscle right, work right. now. So, yeah. so when you're doing belt squats, one of our favorites, something we're prescribing to people all the time, um, what fashion are you doing them in like like what's your technique sexy well that's correct well so that's correct then yeah. <laughs> next question <laughs> um so you do like a stripper squat then every time yeah I, well <laughs> do you have a machine or do you use a like a pin or something yeah we have a machine okay and uh i'm to the point in my training now where even my raw stuff i'm just doing singles because it's you single the belt squat no so i'll do my raw squat singles Equip squat singles. I'll go to the belt squat. What I've been doing lately is uh, I've been doing five sets of ten, and on the last one I'll do a drop set. So yeah. just like stripping plates off and yeah. crying. And how much how much weight do you usually use in the belt squat? Uh, the one we have at our gym, I'll go up to four plates for five sets of ten, and then on that last one, just take a plate off, go to failure. Is it a pulley or? Yeah. So it's not even. It's not exactly like four hundred. Oh no, let's say two twenty-five or four. Oh, I'm sorry, eight eight total plates. So like four hundred five-ish, four hundred pounds. Yeah. Range. But are you are you squatting, trying to make the mechanics of the squat look like your regular squat? Yeah, it's tough because that belt belt it's digs in. Yeah. But yeah, it. I mean, it feels similar-ish. Yeah. It. Yeah, you know, you, I get to the bottom. The first few inches are kind of easy, and then it's like ah, and then. Because yeah. we coach the belt squat very much as like this quad builder, yeah. quad dominant. Yeah, lots push of push your knees forward. Yeah, like we're very different uh, squatting techniques. That yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, you're incredibly successful in the squat. So it's like your technique is excellent for what you do. I mean, but and I've I've never seen anyone in the squat look like they're squatting. Yeah, with the bar on rails, the bar like like you could squat on a Smith machine, because there's just no forward and yeah. backward movement yeah, yeah. of the bar. It's straight up and down, incredible stability. Yeah. With that, do you think uh, training in gear has helped like build that kind of stability? Um, yeah, and honestly, where that comes from. So whenever we for anyone first starts lifting, right, they meet somebody and they're like, hey, this is what you have to think about. One of the um, first cues that I ever heard in my entire life about squatting was looking at it from the side it should look like you're in a smith machine that was like the first thing I ever heard about squat so like I probably squatted for five or six seven years yeah. without being told differently so that just I mean it's so instinctual now that that's like something that happens on every rep and and you're not a guy who has a traditionally like great squat build so <sighs> you had a great squat face <laughs> Squat body, because uh, pretty long, long femurs. Yeah, yeah, very long. And I see people ask this on on Facebook and YouTube and stuff all the time. What squat advice do you have for people with long femurs? And I tend to not be very sympathetic to them because I know you, mm -hmm. I have the best squatter, in, you know, one of the best squatters in the world, long, long femurs. So, what advice do you have for the long femured squatter? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I could ever say to that is. If you think that 
because you have long femurs, you'll always be a shitty squatter and you plant that seed of doubt in your head, mm. never in your life will you ever have a remotely decent squat. So the, if you plant that seed of doubt of giving yourself an excuse to be yeah. negative or, yeah, it's done. So first thing is throw that seed out and know that, yeah, you can be a plenty good squatter. It's just your form's gonna look different. Yeah, It's not gonna, if you think a pretty squat is complete upright torso and no lean, and that's what you try and do. It's, I mean, in reality, you're probably not going to look like that. You just got to find what works for you and not think that you can be a great squatter because you have long femurs. You can't be the most aesthetic squatter on the internet. <laughs> Max Ada. Yeah, I don't know why that is even, why people say that, but. They do. They love it. I don't know. I, it's interesting because I, I get a lot of people ask that. They think, they kind of pigeonhole what you say. Because a lot of times what I'm talking about when I'm telling people about squatting is usually related to like weightlifting or just in general, like you're starting out. And so start with this point and, and then, you know, you know, stay upright, use your legs, start there. You know, if I'm sort of working with somebody in person who is built like you, there be, or like, you know, uh, today was James, right? James has got super short torso, really long legs. And so there's not like a, there's like basic things like, hey, you have to do like this, this, and this to get your squat to, to work properly. But you're not you're not just saying, hey, one size fits all. And it seems like people love to like pigeonhole the idea that like, you know, oh, well, that guy's like all, use just your legs, you gotta be upright. And like these people are like squat like this. When the reality is like, I can, we all know how to teach them how to squat based on the way they, they're built, but it's gonna look very different. The mechanics of the movement are the same. You're using your hips, your legs, your back. It's just a person, you know, how does that pressure shift across those different muscle groups? And, and what is that technique going to look like? Well, it's just like the stuff we talked about in the last episode. Oh, right. Is, is trying to pigeonhole technique for whatever it is. Weightlifting, right. squatting, right. benching, deadlifting, shot put, discus. You know, if, if you're trying to fit everyone into one technical model, it might be right for a lot of people, but you're going to have people yeah. who could potentially be great athletes in whatever sport who are going to be left outside of that model and, and done a disservice right, right. by trying to trying to smash that you know, square peg into the round hole of the technique that you find you know, that you think is best. Because it's, it's not a best technique or you know, right technique, wrong technique. It's, it's got to be adjusted and, and molded to each person. Yeah. One thing that's funny to me is, is that I've seen before, and it was mostly from European guys, was the, the, the coaching talking about how to develop technique or talking about the technique of the exercise for snatch, clean, and jerk for, for powerlifting. And the first thing they do is reference the rules of the sport. And so that's where you build the foundation of what technique is. So, okay, what's the one thing every single squat has to do? It has to, you know, hit depth. So that's where you build the foundation of like this is this is an uh, an absolute that has to apply to everybody at squats, and then you develop what's the best way for each person to achieve that. You know, um, you don't see that a lot where people just kind of pick technique at it like oh it's like you know like do it like this or like that because it's just kind of these arbitrary things. So I think it's kind of I don't it, it's interesting because you have you know like Chad said not a traditional I don't want to say that but not a not this super upright, really leg dominant kind of squat, but you have the best squat in the IPF classic, right? I mean, or, or open, it's like, you know, you can't, you can't say that you're not good at squatting just because you don't have the stereotype build, right? I've thought sometimes too, you know, knowing you and knowing your technique and your, your woes of getting squats passed, mm -hmm. and then being at more USAPL events and stuff, do you think that they tend to favor or judge more favorably a more upright squat? In the IPF, I, or in the USAPL, I can say probably, and in the IPF, I can say for sure. And really? I, think it's, I think it's probably more a subconscious thing. Um, this doesn't look as deep. Yep. Yeah. And uh, especially the European countries, you know, I think they, even the powerlifters are start off as seeing Olympic lifting first and the, right. um, and just at the world championships in 2016 um, me and the Russian were going head to head and you can you can see the video that I, I believe mine was a lot deeper he got he got three whites I got two reds and his I mean he 
he squats kind of like Carl, just completely vertical, lots of forward knee travel. Um, and I think they see that hip dominant butt back initiation and subconsciously maybe judge it harder. Yeah. They hate you because they ain't you. And then, that, then I put chalk on my face to make them hate me more. Haters. Oh, yeah, why, why don't they like that, you think? Because it's not clean and... Be too fun for them? Yes, have too much fun expression boys. of self. You think it's because they've, they've seen you twerk? Possibly. They told me to take it off at, at Worlds. Oh, yeah. The chalk. Did you tell them that's my that's my face? I did. I I'm <laughs> considering bag, doing yeah. like eye black because I feel like if you're a girl and that was part of your makeup, like, they couldn't tell you to take it off. That's you, true. You go like full John Randall. I might. <laughs> <laughs>
and I, I, tr I use track my velocity using an open barbell, right? Um, and I've, you know, put your, your weight and your, velo your mean velocities, and you can plot, like, over many months, what, at what weight this speed moved. And so it's, to me, it's been very accurate and very good in predicting one rep maxes. Mm -hmm. um, my best... Well, with, with that, just from a, like, statistical or data standpoint, you need to have, you'd need to have the bar velocity for 1,100, uh, what, what that was last year. That's, that's true. On my 1100, I mean, it was, it was a little, the hardest. It was a lower velocity than your 1080 was last yeah. year. Yeah. And the, I mean, the reason on that is the bar whip, the yeah. bar shaking. So the, since the bar is that limiting factor, I, I've hit squats and training up to that 1080 where I have, so, I have enough data that I can, like, project out that mm -hmm. the decline in, in mean velocity over added weight. And my, my projected max using that method on my training numbers is a little over 1200. But the the reality of trying to control that bar yeah. over you know eleven hundred pounds is going to be the limiting factor. So, but anyway, that's why I've kind of lately decided to maybe it's smart, maybe it's not to start pushing my my equip numbers and training again now. So it's because maybe I'm not satisfied with eleven hundred now. I want to I want to push the push the limit, and that's gonna that that's been a, an interesting one. You know, with that the IPF rules, it's that one bar has to you know the same bar used for all three three lifts, and for the deadlift, of course the there's a mechanical advantage to be had from a bar that flexes more and is thinner, so it's easier to grip. In the squat, the stability, yes, becomes a factor. And you're probably one of maybe three or five people in the entire IPF that this is a real issue for. Giving you a stiffer bar or you know a, a, a squat bar or something, it's a squat bar and a deadlift bar are not like an equivalent thing. The deadlift bar really helps you lift more weight. The squat bar, I'd say, helps you lift the weight you're capable of lifting. So is there gonna be like a Blaine Sumner rule in the IPF? Where if you put more than 500 kilos on, they let you use a different bar or something? No, there, there's zero <laughs> chance they will ever do anything like that. Well, well maybe if you weren't if you putting chalk on your face. <laughs> what if you tell them that you'll deadlift with the squat bar? There you go. You could, just, you could do you could do all three lifts because on the bench, it wouldn't negatively affect your bench at all. It'd probably be better for your bench too. Yeah. Feel more stable. The deadlift would be tough. Yes. It you feel bar the bar shaking in the de in the bench too with 400. Surprisingly, no. Yeah. Just probably the wider grip, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I guess you wouldn't. In the, the squat, the, everything's in the center, so it's going to have that longer, full, bigger fulcrum right in the middle, right? Yeah. Kind of supporting the outsides. So uh, we just got to get you set up with some, like, exhibition and a squat bar, throw some money at you. And there you go. Watch them take 1200 for a ride. It won't be a ride. It'll be a walk in the park. Oh. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, potato, potato. <laughs> How does this happen? I'm very intrigued to see this. Yeah. Animal Cage 2017. Yeah, animal Cage. <laughs> the day after? I heard, I've heard. i heard a story about you doing like three meats back to back. Uh, a full meat, a raw Two meat. Two meats. Yeah. Tell me this story. So Friday 2014, I think, Arnold 2014? Yes. I did. Yeah, because 2015 you were sick. Yes. I did a raw full meat on Friday, an equipped full meat on Saturday, and equipped bench only on Sunday. And he won all three. I won all three. And he had very close, like, world record attempts multiple times too, right? Yeah. Some that you broke and some that you didn't, or? Yeah. Uh, how, how, how... How bad did you feel on Monday? <laughs> um, an 11 out of 10? Yeah, I bet. <laughs> what was the worst part of that whole thing? Um, the worst I guess of those, the, those, what is that, seven lifts? Yeah. yeah. Two squats, two benches, two, I mean, there's more attempts, but the seven events. Yeah. Oh, um, the worst part was just not being able to enjoy the weekend because it's like, the meat takes up all day Friday, all day Saturday, trying to get sleep, right? And so well, it's just difficult. you can't really enjoy it anyways. So. Yeah. That's crazy. It makes sense that you were training like the higher frequency yeah. way back then, yeah. That's incredible. 
Yeah, I remember when you told me you were going to do that. That's bat crazy. Bat shit crazy, in fact, not just bat crazy. Um, So you got the Arnold. Yep. And then the real big one for you this year is the World of Games, right? Yeah. First time competing at that? First time. So for those not familiar, tell them what the World of Games is. The World of Games is the... Um, recognized by the IOC, it's the International World Games Association. It happens every four years after the Summer Olympics. The year after the Summer Olympics, um, this year it's in Rokla, Poland. There, um, it's really cool. It's how it's structured. Um, they don't have the traditional weight classes. I believe there's lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight, and super heavyweight. And it's just based on Wilkes, so it's not total. So there's a, a winner of those four weight classes based on Wilkes, not total, and then a champion of champions, so best Wilkes over all. That's a cool title. Yeah. You have the highest Wilkes ever. I do. What is your Wilkes? 692. 692. 692. Oh. So, <laughs> okay. 69 and 2. <laughs> well, that's pretty good. It's, it's all right. Yeah. That's a, that's a cool idea, though, with the... With the no weight classes yeah. set up. Yeah. And so our other, you know, you say recognized by the IOC. Uh, we had an earlier episode on this, you know, several, you know, close to a year ago now, um, when the IPF had announced, you know, there were pictures of, of Robert Keller and stuff with with IOC officials and everyone in the USAPL is getting fired up. We're going to the Olympics. And so Max and I stumbled upon a list of other sports recognized by the IOC. Will the powerlifting at the World Games be going on next to the Korfball field? Um, or it's around the corner from Boule? Between squat and bench, they do the Boule. Okay. And then between bench and deadlift, they do the Korf ball. What about orienteering? Do you guys do that after? Afterwards. That's how you find the medal That's ceremony. That's where you find yeah. the medal <laughs> <laughs> You have to orienteer your way to the medal ceremony. <laughs> but the, do they have any for all the other sports like that at, at the World Games? Uh, I've never been. I've seen okay. the footage. But looking at the website, yeah, there's lots of weird sports. Yeah, the off, off-brand, the Hydrox. The Hydrox of other sports. <laughs> Hydrox of hockey. Yeah. That, that was Boule, I think. Boule, yeah. What was the yeah, one? Boule is bocce ball. Handball. Well, but not handball. It was or right. Team it was handball. Team handball, maybe. Team handball is awesome. No, there was another sport that was. It's not handball like bandy. You know, bandy, man. Bandy was the off-brand of hockey. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of very. Which I thought field hockey was the off-brand. <laughs> no, that's just, that's just, there's a lot of crazy sports out there. Yeah. High lie. High lie. High lie. That's the most deadly sport in the world. Is it really? Yeah, the ball goes really fast and is really hard. Really? Yeah, this is like racquetball, I think, but they, they have those word like scoop. It's not that small. It's gigantic. It's just like yeah, so, and, and a prosthetic it's, thing. They can whip out of that. How come no one's made a movie where the villain kills people with that? <laughs> I feel like in Lethal Weapon, Lethal Weapon 7, the person may use a, may use a boulet. Uh, a, what do you think they call? Uh, uh, what is the name of that handle thing? Yeah. The, the high ally prosthetic arm. <laughs> I bet that thing costs a fortune, too. I bet you those guys, when they show up to the gym, they drop their gym bag and pull one out. They pull out like a case and they have to like open it up, you know. <laughs> the guy polishes it up. He has his like manservant because you know, only like super rich people play it. Oh, for sure. You know, he puts it on and like loads it up with a ball and just throws it through some guy's chest, kills him right there. Oh, this is a, a Basque sport. I don't know what Marissa knows about. High lies Basque? That's what it's saying. Look at that thing. It's called a Zestera. Oh. That's the perfect X- name for it. X-I-S-T-E-R-A. That could just be the villain's name. <laughs> what is it? X-I-S-T-E-R-A. Zestera? Zestera. Zestera? That sounds like a supplement. It sounds like it a sounds... stripper name. It, that too, yeah. <laughs> Very much is it, yeah. That is definitely It sounds like a venereal disease that you would get from that stripper. It could be all of those <laughs> things, actually. Huh? Uh, how did we arrive upon this? Oh yeah, World oh, Games. World Games. Uh, what, what's the dates on that? It's at the end of July. So I think it goes from end of July to the beginning of August or so. That'll be exciting. I'm excited to see what you do there. Especially now that you told everyone you're going to squat 1,200. You heard it here first. Oh. Blaine Sumner. 12 Hunsky. 1,200 at the World Games. Yep. 
Okay, good. I'm glad he went. He just went along with that. Done. Fantastic. Done. Not scared. Um, yeah, Arnold World Games going to be a big year for the Vanilla Gorilla. It will be. Where can people learn more about you, Brian? They can learn more about me. I do most of my stuff content-wise on Instagram, the Vanilla Gorilla 92. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I don't do much with it. I have a Facebook. I don't post much there. And my website, BlaineSumner.com. I remember when I was first trying to find like uh, pictures of you for Here we go. the website. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that if you Googled Blaine Sumner in like 2011, 11. 2012, Blaine was the less popular, apparently, Blaine Sumner, the less Googled Blaine Sumner, and the more Googled Blaine Sumner seemed to be some sort of male porn star, gay porn star? Gay porn star. Gay porn star. Yes. Yeah. I didn't have the safe search on, and... Wow. <laughs> The Google Images was not, I was like, wow, that's he's, not, he's gained a lot of weight since then. Oh my God. <laughs> that's, that's rough. Yeah. Right, so, BlaineSumner.com, the power lifter, not the other one. Montana, <laughs> where can they find you? You find me on Instagram at Max underscore Ada, or on Facebook, or via email, MaxJTSStrength, if you want to get in touch with us about the gym. I'm Chad Wesley Smith, at Chad Wesley Smith, and at Juggernaut Training. Again, the Jug Life Podcast is brought to you by Virus International, Grind Sports Nutrition, Jug, J-U-G-G. We'll get you 10% off from both of them. Or visit trifectanutrition.com slash juggernaut to get all kinds of great food delivered right to your door. And definitely don't forget about mustaches and muscle-ups. It's a lifestyle. And it's, as we were discussing before... No, no straighter thing. What if two guys touch mustaches while they do muscle ups? That's the straightest thing ever done. Straightest thing ever done. It's so straight you could never even conceive of that not <laughs> being just completely a straight. Nothing more manly than a mustache. That's the most manly thing. Yeah. <laughs> if they were wearing sunglasses too. <laughs> Is that so like they, Tom Selleck scenario. they can't look into each other's eyes? Or you can't tell if they're making <laughs> eye contact? <laughs> Blaine and I had a very locked-in eye contact photo <laughs> earlier with Adam Rodriguez. Uh, uh, I saw that. This is the Jug Life Podcast. If you liked it, give us a five-star review on iTunes. That would really help on the rankings and all that stuff. And if you didn't like it, well, just go listen to something else. Until next week.